Wow. That usually happens at the end rather than the beginning. But anyway, it's really it's brilliant to be here today. Thank you for inviting me to chair the session. Okay, this uh, event, and uh, it's, I think uh, I'm particularly uh, pleased um, uh, to be part of this today because uh, health and well-being of buildings has been something that's been quite close to me right from the for ages, actually. Even from uh, beginning my uh, architecture career at university, my thesis was all about the impact of buildings on their environment, and, 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 and or rather, impacts of building on, on the occupants. So I'm really pleased that the whole subject matter is sort of climbing the ladder of our consciousness and, uh, and, uh, and people's thinking within uh, designing buildings. Um, so I, um, I'm not going to say very much. I'm just going to be chairing this fantastic lineup that we have of four speakers. The, line, the way that we're going to uh, deal with this is each person is going to be speaking for 15 minutes, and then we're going to hold on to those questions uh, so that at the end we'll have a chance, uh, 25, 30 minutes to be able to ask those questions and, um, and have a nice debate, hopefully, with uh, some of the things. Now, I haven't actually said this to the speakers yet, but I'm going to ask you at the end for sort of top tips, maybe the top tip of something that you think that people should absolutely take away from today in terms of designing. So I'll say that now so that you can be thinking after your presentation, probably. Be okay, so um, first up, we have Vicky. And I've got biogs here, so I'm going to do quickly summarise around these. So Vicky Lockhart, uh, Director of Business uh, Development Europe and um, expertise in green building practice, passion for leveraging new research. Um, the, re the main reason here is representing well. Um, so she was uh, one of the first people to be uh, part of the well standard. Well, um, and um, so well building standard is the full uh, title. Um, educates industry and after developing a uh, new health and wellbeing services um, at uh, Arup, she joined the International Well Building Institute that is now based in London and drives that mission forward to improve health and wellbeing through a built environment in uh, England but across Europe. So fantastic. And I'm going to introduce each speaker as and when they come up so that you're there. So thanks. Over to you. people. Um, thank you for coming along today um, and I'm just going to show you some updates from IWBI side. So IWBI, International <coughs> Well Building Institute, is a public benefit corporation that is set up with the mission around promoting health and well-being through the built environment. Why did we start with buildings and the environment? Because this is actually over half of what actually constitutes an individual's or influences state of health at any one time. So we know that genetics plays a role, we know that quality of medical services plays a role, but it's actually the physical and social environment and more of those day-to-day -day lifestyle decisions that people are making that is really influencing individual state of health at any one time. So great news for us as practitioners in the built environment, we can have a really strong positive influence on people to help them manage those things better. And buildings as, as the starting point because we spend so much time inside them. So if we think about where is our physical social environment that we are surrounded with, generally it's inside spaces like this. It's where we live, it's where we work, and it's where we go out to have fun. So the two programs that we as IWBI run, there is a certification program for projects and there is an AP credential for professionals who want to get to grips with the research and designate their expertise in this area. If we look very quickly at kind of global uptake since we launched, the standard went public late in 2014 and has seen some really like encouraging and strong growth since that time. So we've now got projects registered in 31 countries worldwide, um, over 640 and 130 million square feet. <coughs> Zooming in slightly on Europe region, which is where I kind of take care of, uh, we've got 130 projects in over 13 different countries. Where did well come from? How was it developed? And what's kind of gone into the process of these criteria? This was a really lengthy process because the worlds of medicine and public health weren't traditionally talking and interfacing with the built environment and building science communities. So it took a period of eight years to start that dialogue, get the right people in the right room to forge a common language and understand where the research says there's an interface between environment and health and then very practically in terms of implementable advice, what can built environment practitioners as designers, engineers, operators of spaces actually do to optimize those? 
And as we were going through this process, it very quickly became evident this isn't purely a design exercise. This isn't something that can be passed to the team as an objective and then handed over to the project owner day one. This requires a really integrated process. It's as much about organization as it is about building. Um, and it's trying to bring those two together around a common goal and make sure every aspect of that experience of being within that space is sending these same messages around health. The standard itself is comprised of seven different concepts or categories. Um, so we're going to run through these super quickly in 15 minutes, um, but do ask questions if you've got any, anything more specific. <coughs> air, we're thinking about the internal air quality of what people are breathing and exposed to, and all of the parameters that influence or make that up. So ventilation systems, cleaning regimes, construction practices, material selection, and so on. Water, we're thinking about the quality of water that people are drinking so that they are not exposed to certain contaminants that we know have health impacts, and also how prominent that water is, how easy it is for people to stay hydrated through the day, and whether they're getting that passive cue to kind of remind themselves to, to grab another glass. This is the point at which everyone always takes another sip of their cup, so please do. <laughs> Nourishment, we start thinking about the dietary habits and the eating patterns of people within buildings. So that relates to the food service offerings that are provided. It also relates to the actual dining spaces and the environments in which people are, are consuming food. Um, and also more kind of broader <coughs> subjects about connection to food provenance, the opportunity to cultivate, to understand how things are grown, and we forge that connection back to nature and natural cycles. On the light category, this is a kind of dual aspect, definitely the visual comfort and traditional realms of good practice building design are in there, and then also this circadian lighting aspect, so reinforcing healthy sleep-wake cycles and making sure we're not disrupting internal processes that regulate our body through the day through what light is entering our eye. On the fitness side, we've got basically two objectives. First, ensure that people have great access to fun and engaging exercise opportunities. Those might be subsidized by the organization. It might be physically within the space, so it's super easy to get there and it's not a big kind of time commitment. Um, and also trying to think about how we can raise awareness about more basic movement, whether that's giving people wearables or different furniture that encourages different um, positions and postures through the day, aspects like that. On the comfort side, this is kind of broadly on thermal comfort, acoustic comfort, and ergonomics. So thinking across those parameters and also accessibility, that kind of universal design imperative to make sure that everyone has equitable access. And then finally, the mind concept is really trying to think about mental health and stress management. So what can we do in both building design through techniques like biophilia, um, and also through our HR and employee benefits programs to make sure people have the support and the resources they need to better manage that kind of burden that they're carrying around. We know that mental health conditions in general are on the rise. There is a kind of stress epidemic in the world, particularly in the workplace, in the modern workplace. And so there are different strategies that companies can implement to try and address that. Back on the kind of certification process. So this kind of flow chart will seem relatively familiar to those who have worked on a, a LEED or a BREEAM project. The big difference with WELL is that we have this recertification cycle. So we want to make sure we'll come back every three years to revisit that project, take, take the same kind of documents and take the same kind of measurements to ensure that that continuous performance is maintained over time. Uh, in terms of kind of rating levels, there are these three different tiers. Um, and we were the first standard out there in the market to actually help define with concrete metrics what is well-being in the built environment and how can you start to compare different strategies and different kind of aggregates of approaches across building to building or company to company. Another big differentiator is this stage of verification. So there is an element of kind of audit trail and documentation that is submitted and reviewed but the big emphasis is shifted to this on-site visit and verification, which is a combination of spot checks, visual audits and inspections, and on-site testing of things like air quality, water quality, lighting, and acoustic performance. The great advantage of this is that it decreases the burden on admin trail. Everything we can inspect on-site in the building, we will do. The other things get documented. 
Um, and it also gives the project owners the confidence that what they set out to achieve has actually been delivered at the end of the day. This also happens post-occupancy in most situations. So for a buildings or interiors project, we want to wait until the population is in that space and it's operating as it usually would, with all the furniture, with all the stuff, with all the people and the messy variables, because that's the real life conditions where we actually want to ensure these healthy parameters are being achieved. Another factor on how we've been able to scale and kind of uh, reach such wide global audiences is our flexibility. So by virtue of being a performance standard, we're able to work with teams to create different um, alternative methodologies to reach the same health intent. And that means we can draw on all the best practice in local markets and also work with great innovators and project teams that say, I understand what we're trying to do from a health perspective, but here, given these set of parameters, this is the route we'd like to go, go through to achieve that. In terms of the kind of certification process, we have an independent partner that does the certification for our projects. So we, as IWBI, define the criteria and help educate the industry around what those are. GBCI are the ones that actually verify when projects have achieved it or not. So there's this clear separation there. And finally, we've really made a big effort to make sure that projects are able to bind this in as part of their existing environmental strategies. So we don't want any projects to be facing this decision. Do we do something environmental or do we do something for people? The idea is that we need the health of the planet and our human populations to kind of be tackled at the same time, people and planet agenda. So we've got four published crosswalks with leading environmental rating schemes at the moment, LEED, BREEAM, Green Star, and Living Building Challenge. And we're working this year to start expanding that further in new markets as we're growing. Just looking back at kind of Europe and typology, I was going to wrap up with a few examples, and you're going to be hearing from Ed later on with more detailed case study. So if we look at Europe, these figures are actually from October, so slightly, slightly older. Um, but the biggest uptake has been from the speculative developer market. So it's been very much led by those that want to differentiate in the market. They want to push their existing high sustainability benchmarks up to another level and they want to attract really great tenants into their spaces. So the big organizations in competitive markets that are trying to attract the best talent. Behind that, it's obviously the interior. So now it's the wave of those organizations moving into these types of spaces that are looking at it for their own premises. Why are building owners interested? Uh, this piece of research came out in 2016, was based on a survey of a number of different owners. And the biggest reason they gave was the impact on occupant satisfaction. So they were seeing this as a really good way of engaging tenants and customers and being able to show that they were having a, a kind of premium experience with them as their landlord. Otherwise, there's optimism around leasing rate and building value going up. Uh, the first core and shell project over in France in, is uh, by a company called HRO. It's the Senio project in Baison, which is just near Paris. Uh, it's a beautiful project. There's a great case study of it on our website. The link's on the bottom if you want to find out more. Um, finally, the kind of organizations and the interiors program, the reason employers are looking at this is to kind of demonstrate to um, external audiences their leadership in this area and their really strong commitment to staff. Some are using it as a tool to kind of consolidate existing various strategies that it's are kind of spread through HR and real estate and other factors of their business into something that's very coherent. Um, and otherwise, people are doing it to try and attract those, those initial <coughs> applicants. So here in London, we've got the Kundal project was the first one in Europe that was finished up in 2015, I believe. CBRE over in Madrid certified one floor of their existing office as a kind of showcase for tenants coming in. Landsec, we're going to be hearing more about from Ed, so I will let him tell you his story. Uh, and thank you very much. Look forward to your questions. Ed Garrod yeah. is a principal at Elementor Consulting. So Ed is head of sustainability there. And um, in, two th in 2016, he became the first Fitwell ambassador in Europe. So we're looking, moving on to uh, New Kid on the Block, maybe? Would call it? Anyway, this is a, 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 a different uh, measure. And in March, uh, 17 was responsible for achieving that first Fitwell certification of their premises, um, and which is uh, London, in the office based in London. So he's advisor and lecturer to the uh, new MSc course, Health, Wellbeing and Sustainability at UCL. 
and jointly leading the research of, of a British Council of Officers, so BCO, for um, their announced Wellness Matters initiative, which is brilliant, isn't it, that that's happening? So there you go. Over to you. Thank you very much. Um, morning, everyone. I'm Ed. Um, I'm going to ask you quickly a first question. How many of you have some form of fitness tracker on your hand or on your phone right now? Okay, so it's probably about 60%. How many of you had that same tracker on, on your hand or in your pocket three years ago? Two, three. So this is the, the big trend that we're seeing. There's much more self-awareness. The, the rise of health and well-being as an issue within the built environment is driven by demand that's coming from uh, the users of this space, and it's a demand that we see within our own business. So I'm going to give you a, um, a quick tour about how we managed to get Fitwell certified. Um, but before I do, it's probably worth making it clear that we're very much platform neutral. We work with the World Building Standard and with Fitwell. We're looking at all of the different standards in our work. Um, but we, we chose to test Fitwell in our office, and, and I'll explain why. So there we were. We got um, awarded um, in March of last year. We did it in six weeks. Uh, and um, that was part of the attraction, was to see whether you could break the system, how quickly could it be done. It was offered as something that was inexpensive and quick to do. Um, just like, well, in, in some respects, it's based on a, uh, an evidence base that's been put together over a number of years with input from um, medical health, public health, um, and built environment professionals. Fundamentally, though, Fitwell comes from a, a government perspective. It was initiated by the federal government in the States as part of their preventative health strategy. Um, and geared towards looking at the federal estate and how you could protect the health and well-being of, of employees working um, for the American government and then see whether that could form a basis to, to spread outside. It's structured in a slightly different way to well. Well is structured in terms of these, these areas, these principles that it looks at, um, which are, um, in, in, in a certain respects, quite abstract because they're talking about um, areas of impact, whereas most facilities managers, and in a way Fitwell's aimed towards people on the ground, understand the buildings as a journey through them. So it thinks of how we get to a building, how we get into the building, um, what spaces we've moved through as we went there, how we come in, how we move up through the building and so on, all the way through the space down to what would happen in an emergency. So if things go horribly wrong, where would I go to find that, that bit of equipment that I need? Its background is really very much geared towards public health. Um, so there are public health domains that are, that are tackled in each of the strategies that, that Fitwell looks to apply to buildings. And in terms of its background, it was based on a pilot study of um, 89 projects, and they looked at rating a vast array of, of buildings in different states of disrepair and, and excellence um, across um, the United States. And that bell curve you see there is the points distribution of those different projects. And they wanted to work out that, to make sure that if you do do a points-based scoring system, um, that you end up recognizing those that are, that are well above the median and, and, and recognize excellence in that, that upper quartile or upper 10%. The scoring system is 0 to 144. God knows why. Would have been much easier to make it 0 to 100, but that's life. Um, and you have to achieve over uh, 90 points in order to be in the game um, to, to get, get a basic level of certification, which is one star. We achieved two star. Um, I think if we recertified now as the standard has been updated, we probably would be borderline between one and two. To get to three star really requires a lot of effort, both as an organization and in the design and operation of your space. What is quite different between Well and Fitwell is that Fitwell takes the approach that every single step towards improving health and well-being in the workplace should be rewarded and encouraged. So it doesn't have any barriers uh, in terms of preconditions, uh, minimum standards that you have to, to work with. Um, some might see that as weakness. In, in other ways, it makes the, the, the journey towards um, improving health and well-being in the workplace, more of a, a step process rather than fearing that you're looking at this cliff and, and it, it helps ease people along that path. Um, so because of that, you're able to access Fitwell on pretty much any project anywhere in the world, at any stage, uh, whether it's been built, whether it's in operation, um, and, and apply the principles to your particular case. And what fascinated me from a consultancy perspective is is how we make these decisions around what matters most. Uh, we always face finite budgets of time um, and, and money, most importantly. So you say to someone, well, should we do this? Should we do that? Fitwell introduced this approach of weighting all these issues. So for example, it said, what would, what would be more impactful to have that defibrillator on every floor or to have a, a lactation room where um, mothers who are still nursing could, could express milk and store it? So 
it's a tough one, I wouldn't know the answer. Um, you get a panel of medical experts together and they say, actually, you should go for that lactation room because the direct impact on that infant and on the mother um, is very large and it's long lasting. Whereas the defibrillator, though very important, is something that um, overall on balance apparently is, is not such a significant health benefit. In terms of how you get certified, um, focused here is low cost, quick. Um, it's $500 to register, you get access to the platform by doing that, and a further $6,000 to get yourself certified, um, which means you've capped your certification cost regardless of size of project, uh, which is, um, makes it relatively expensive for small projects, but it, on very big projects it becomes kind of noise in the background. So here's our office, this is what we walked into. We'd um, moved space from a fantastic um, daylight space in Southwark with great views into a horrible insurance office with frosted windows and all the rooms were named after types of whiskey. Uh, the, the kitchen was sort of the last place you want to go to do anything and within two or three days people were coming to us saying I'm leaving, can't work here, it's horrible. Um, because we're you know, sort of a people focused business we put our hand in our pocket and raised four and a half thousand pounds there's not a zero missing there, to try and fix this problem. And we actually used the world building standard to, to guide how we would allocate that work, um, th that initiative, because Fitwell didn't exist at the time. So um, as a trained interior designer, not, um, we use PowerPoint to do our proposals. This is, this, is, this is what's wrong. Look at that. Who needs CGI? <laughs> <laughs> That's what we could fix. Um, and um, you know, I managed to, to convince our management team that we should put some money towards doing this with graphics of this vast quality. And we um, you know, some really basic stuff. We took away that horrible film, which was all about privacy, um, and brought the daylight in. We maximized what was there. I mean, we couldn't change this building. We didn't have the opportunity to design it from scratch and improve it. So actually having a view of a wall and a slight slant, slanting glance down to Cheapside is much better from the kitchen than having that frosted window. So we, we did that. Um, we had people staring at party walls. First step was to make them green. That didn't make much of an effort di difference. But panorama of the Bay Area, where one of our biggest offices is based, about connecting us to um, colleagues around the world, but also giving people biophilia in a slightly unconventional way. And people love it, but we also found that people don't like sitting with their back to it because they feel that they're being about to be pounced on, um, which we hadn't expected. Um, our reception area, a strange barcode of wooden things. We inherited this. We haven't got money to change this stuff. We're not um, in the position to do that. It's a really scrappy sort of startup company. So we asked the receptionist, um, what would you like? They chose uh, a forest scene with the sun coming up. Uh, we trialed doing birdsong generators in, in the office. I absolutely love it. I can work with birdsong and waterfall generators in a room. Much more productive. Two or three people were so upset by it, it's been removed. <laughs> so you live and learn. It's not guaranteed that biophilia will work. Um, people are, you know, don't eat well, typically, in, in, in the work environment. So we looked at whether we could combine the two, biophilia with food. We grow our own salad crops on, um, on the premises and, and have a little bit of a feast of that. We test our air quality. People were moaning that it was horrible. Get a Fubot, no, not the most reliable thing, but it gives you a, a sense of where you're heading. Um, so we took control back of the data. So if someone comes to us and says it's really, really stuffy in here. Well, actually, it's not. It's probably that you're, that's a symptom of something else that's going on. So how did we use Fitwell in our space? We'd, we'd kind of exhausted well. We knew we couldn't certify because there are so many things that are wrong with this building. It's 25 years old. It was never going to actually get over some of those precondition requirements within well. Um, so I'll take you through very quickly now through some of the aspects that Fitwell considers. What you're seeing there um, up on the right-hand side is a donut where you can see the distribution of, of weighted points per, per these different categories. Um, if it's in blue, we got it. Um, if it's in red, we didn't. And if it's grayed out, it's because it wasn't applicable to what we were doing. So we're in a fantastically accessible location. That's rewarded. Highest walk score ever recorded within the Fitwell system. They, couldn't, they thought we'd broken it. Um, getting into the building, um, Fitwell asked us to do a travel survey. How do our staff even get to work? Most practices or companies don't really know. Um, what it revealed was far more cycling demand than could ever be uh, looked for by the building. We took this to our, um, to our landlord and said, look, you're doing some upgrades. We need more bike space, and that's now happening. So Fitwell here is about um, organizational change. We don't have any outdoor space under control of the building, but we're near spaces that you can get, get access to. Uh, so you're understanding your proximity to opportunities for outdoor exercise is important. Um, we looked at pest control, found out that we had loads of rat boxes or mouse boxes. No one knew who'd got them under contract. We asked MIT. They hadn't got any record of us even being on their system. Obviously, someone has seen it in the corner thought, leave it. Um, so some of this is just about kind of 
getting to know your building. We put proper smoking signage up outside the building. It wasn't in place. Um, and um, we, d we did get rewarded for our little hydroponics thing, but they've since changed the regulations when they saw how tiny it was <laughs> in reality. Um, when you come into the building, we're thinking about security and making people feel comfortable. You're in a well-lit environment. It's accessible to people uh, regardless of, of ability. Um, that led us to getting the lighting fixed. So this is a lot. This is about the story of engagement with our landlord. Uh, we put a well-being corner in, which is really successful. A year later, that's that's very popular. Um, staff share, you know, cafes that you can go to that serve healthy food, walks you can go to around town where you'll see different types of tree, uh, all that kind of stuff. This is the stairwell that um, Well and Fitwell would love you to have. Um, our stairwell looks like the one in the middle. And because we're on a single floor, it's actually outside of scope for Fitwell. If you're a single floor. Um, project. You don't have to take responsibility for how nice your staircase is, but still, um, we used. Uh, we were inspired by the encouragement to get people to use the stairs. Basic barrier to access here was that no one knew the code to the door. Um, part of the upgrade works that we're going through now with our landlord means that everyone's on a pass, so you can just swipe through that door. People use the stairs a hell of a lot more. Simple things that can be fixed, and the signage encourages people to take action. Our indoor environment. I talked about having a food bot in place and, and smoking. Um, descriptions and signage everywhere. We've also got air quality policies in, in place now. Um, and it has, it has real teeth because if someone comes to you in a, in a work environment and says, I, you know, I'm not happy with the air quality, what would you do? What's your process map for dealing with that complaint and finding a solution? So we worked on a lot of the best practice that comes out of the States. There really is very little guidance in the UK about how to deal with these issues. Uh, so I'd encourage people to, to Google that. Um, and also, we put some responsibilities in place for our staff. So actually in America, a lot of federal properties will ban you wearing scent um, in the workplace because people with chemical sensitivities can have very strong adverse reactions to um, things like lin links. And one of my colleagues had a habit of coming in and doing that in the open office and everyone else is like, God, you know. And then um, he does that and then the food bot goes absolutely wild. And he's like, oh, I hadn't realized. So these feedback mechanisms um, are very useful within, within a work environment. We have a green purchasing plan um, triggered by looking at Fitwell. Um, biggest impact for me was that within a, within a week, our you know, head of procurement effectively for that kind of stuff had managed to get rid of all the pens that were giving people headaches. So simple stuff that uh, makes a big difference. We reconfigured our workspace so that we maximized the people that were sat nearest the window. It's a very deep floor plan where we have. A really simple thing to do, actually. Um, we created... Um, layout space where the daylight and the views was the least. We put in standing desks as a, an, a, an option for people to work from, uh, I think we've got four now, um, which are proper move up, down ones, and others that are uh, positions that you can alter. The evidence behind sit-stand desks is pretty, pretty mixed, if we're being honest. Um, there are some very strong indicators that um, working standing up is good for you, um, but equally standing up all day is probably not good for you. And the, the key thing there is the opportunity to have choice. What we do find, though, is once these desks are put into an environment, it becomes an expectation of your staff to have access to them. So it becomes the well-being of your staff becomes impacted if they're not offered the choice. And I think that's where we're, we're moving to in this world. We're a very rigorous organization about how we pay for things. Um, so we had to test three so that we chose the right one. Um, we chose a kangaroo. Um, you can do it for 50 quid. Uh, this is the one that I have at home, um, bought off Amazon. Perfectly functional. Probably doesn't pass health and safety, but really, who cares? Um, we got the signage changed in our toilets to encourage people to wash their hands. I had to sign so many waivers that we weren't going to scratch a mirror, but we got them up there eventually. And the shocking thing is that um, only 38% of men wash their hands after going to the toilet. And you ladies are not that much better. Um, so let's think about shaking hands in the middle of a flu season and what might be happening. Um, we have shared spaces. We access our staff are allowed to do um, yoga classes and use them for those kind of uses. You don't need to do that. This isn't fit well compliant. Um, <laughs> but, you know, why not? Then um, we can have exercise within all our lives. Water supply, we don't actually meet the current requirements in Fitwell for giving full access to people in wheelchairs um, for, a fresh, for, for drinking water supply. We're not far off it. You can see on the, on the uh, left-hand side, that's my colleague Marco. You can get a wheelchair underneath our sink, but actually, if you have mobility issues on your upper body, you wouldn't be able to get access to, to drinking water. So that's something we'll think about as we change that. We don't have an automatic defibrillator on our floor. It costs about £4,000 to get one installed, and you have to maintain it. Um, but our neighbours do. So guess what? We asked them, could we use it if one of us had a heart attack? Um, unsurprisingly, the response was, absolutely, you go for it. 
Um, Fitwell gives you this dashboard and a scorecard that allows you to, to keep track of what you're doing. Um, so it's quite interactive and simple. Uh, gives you some outputs to tell you where you're doing really well, where you could do better, and that helps you guide uh, improvement over time. So we keep track of this and we update this as we go along. And then moving forward, there's new versions of Fitwell that have been customized for different end uses um, as the, the early testing of the program has, has been rolled out. And Gresby, which is the portfolio sustainability standard, has now um, it has a partnership where the health and well-being module, you can use Fitwell as a way of demonstrating across the portfolio that you're addressing health and well-being um, for those that own big portfolios. Um, and then finally, this is the kind of workshops we've been doing for the BCO where we look at everything from what's happening in Brienne, what's happening in Fitwell, what's happening in Well, what's happening completely outside this and ask people how we start to work out what matters. Um, and that should be coming out um, for the Berlin conference, which is coming up in, in May. So keep your eyes peeled for that. Um, and that's me done. Thank you. So we have uh, Dr. Chris Ward, who is principal consultant at uh, Bream. Or BRE, what do, you, what do you call it? Bree and Bream. I oscillate between the two. Yeah, I think it's probably Bream. Bream, okay, there we go. We'll, we'll go with that. So, uh, Chris is responsible for leadership and management of science and evidence bases underpinning aspects of Bream. And um, he is responsible for the research program, maintaining it. And um, so, you've been busy with 2018 having come out. Yeah, right. Um, and, um, and identifying research needs and potential funding mechanisms for it as well. So since joining Bree RE in, 20, uh, in 2011, he's managed various projects, and they have included uh, environmental weightings, performance gap, I'm summarizing here, um, uh, research into uh, VOCs, volatile organic compounds, I'm sure you all knew that because you're in, here in the room, uh, remediation of contaminated land, uh, macro objectives, environmental macro objectives in buildings. There's a long list of stuff you've been doing uh, and, te and uh, technically mapping out uh, uh, the Bream as well. So we're going to hear about how uh, health and wellbeing fits into Bream now. Thank you very much. Right, thank you very much. Uh, as typical for a wellbeing event, I've woken up with a sore throat, so <laughs> hopefully I won't have any to raise, to raise my uh, coughing style fits uh, over the next 15 minutes. Good, I haven't got any coughing fits. <laughs> um, I'm assuming quite a lot of the audience have, have come across Bream in some shape or form, so I'll, I'll quickly whiz through um, um, what, what Bream is, um, the, the sort of standards we have, where it's applied and, and the technical content. Uh, then I'll move on to... Um, the health and well-being coverage within Bream, and then finally have a look at uh, our relationship with the other well-building standard, uh, well-being standards that we've heard about already this morning. Okay, I won't read through all of that, but I guess the, the main point to, 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 to come out of that is that Bream isn't a well-building, uh, a well-being standard. Um, it is a su sustainability standard covering all three pillars of, of sustainability and probably health and well-being issues probably fall mostly in the social and partly in the environmental uh, uh, side of that. Um, just a couple other points to pick out. We encourage continuous performance, um, improvement and innovation. Um, our requirements are science-based and we aim to move those beyond current regulations and standard practice. Uh, our standards cover the whole life cycle of, 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 of buildings and, and the wider built environment and our independent certification aims to provide value to, to users. A um, few other sort of facts. Um, we were the first, uh, the world's first um, sustainability assessment method. Um, we were launched in 1990, so we've been going quite a while now compared to some of these newer kids on the block. Um, <laughs> as I say, it's a sustainability assessment scheme and we cover nine technical categories, which I'll come on to later. Um, we're an international standard. We've applied, uh, Brit Bream's been applied and projects have been certified in over 70 countries around the world. And we're able to adapt um, the Bream schemes to, to, to local conditions. Um, assessments are performed by our network of licensed assessors. So they do all gather all the evidence. That comes to BRE uh, where it's quality assured and, and we, we, we issue the certificate based on the assessor's um, assessment. Uh, mentioned before, all of our requirements are based on um, science-based standards, and I've mentioned innovation. Um, so, 
I mentioned we, 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 we run a variety of schemes across, across the built environment. This, this slide is just meant to highlight those. We have a com Bream community scheme that covers master planning projects. Um, we have an infra well, we have two infra infrastructure schemes at present. We have a Bream infrastructure pilot, and we've recently acquired C SQL, um, uh, very similar in environmental assessment scheme for infrastructure in the last couple of years. So we're in the process of merging those those two schemes together to produce one um, scheme for, for, for uh, assessing infrastructure projects. Um, most of you are probably have come across Bream on, on, on our building certification schemes. Um, again, we, we have a variety of schemes covering the, 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 the life cycle of the built environment. Our, probably our flagship scheme is, is our new construction scheme, um, which covers the design and construction of, of, of new buildings. Um, we also have an in-use scheme, which covers operational performance of buildings, um, i.e. post-occupancy. And we have, a re well, we have a domestic refurbishment scheme and a non-domestic refurbishment and fit-out scheme covering obviously refurb and, and fit-out projects. Uh, we also run the Home Quality Mark, um, which is effectively our new construction scheme for um, domestic buildings, new domestic buildings. Um, in terms of assessment, uh, I've mentioned before, aim, uh, Bream aims to push performance beyond regulation and, and standard practice. So we have five ratings ranging from pass through to good, very good, excellent, and outstanding. So even a, a pass, at a, a, a Bream project that um, is certified as a pass, um, demonstrate performance beyond standard practice and, and regulation. Um, in terms of the excellent rating, that demonstrates a performance of the top 10% of the, of the building stock, outstanding 1% um, of, 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 of your top 1% of the, the performance for the building stock. Um, I mentioned um, we're an international standard, so we have international versions of, of all of our schemes. Uh, the light green there shows where BREAM projects have been certified across the glo globe using our international schemes. We also have locally adapted schemes highlighted by the, the, the darker green there. Um, we have our UK scheme operated by, by BRE, um, but we've all, in, in the last sort of five, ten years or so, we've also partnered with a range of um, organisations across the globe um, for that, and they have adapted um, the Bream International Scheme for use in, in their own uh, local environment. So we've now got national scheme operators in Norway, Sweden, um, the Netherlands, Spain, uh, USA and we have a German based organisation that operates schemes in Germany, Austria and Switzerland. Um, moving on to the technical categories. Um, the, 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 there are nine technical categories plus an innovation um, category. Um, as pr probably most of you are aware, Bream covers the sort of range of sustainability issues from energy through to water to waste and, and, and materials. But obviously, health and well-being is, 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 is one of those uh, categories and, and, and uh, is, is obviously the focus of today's event. In terms of innovation, we reward projects that demonstrate exemplary performance or uh, have implemented in innovative um, processes uh, as, as part of their, their project. Okay, so move, moving on to the health and well-being focus of Bream. Um, it's been an integral part of Bream from, from, the, from day one uh, in 1990. There were three categories back then, one of them being indoor effects. It covered things like in, indoor air quality, Legionnaire's disease, and sort of emissions from hazardous materials. Um, over the years, over the 1990s, that, that scope of that was expanded to cover, um, to reflect issues at, at, at the time, such as sick, bu sick building syndrome, um, which led to a health and well-being category being formally introduced in 1998. Again, since then, health and well-being issues covered by Bream have evolved to uh, reflect best practice, move on with how, how, how industry has evolved. Um, Another important point to note is that although we have a health and well-being category, some of the other categories do touch on well-being related issues. For example, there's active, active travel um, requirements within the transport section, there's sort of noise and light pollution and air quality issues within the pollution section, um, green space and biophilia type issues within our land use and ecology section, and things like post-occupancy evaluation within the management section. Um, I won't dwell on this slide. Um, back in 
about 18 months ago, we released a free to download briefing paper on health and wellbeing coverage within Bream, which sets out across uh, all of our schemes where health and, health and wellbeing issues are, are addressed throughout. Uh, similarly, uh, another free to download um, briefing paper was published late in 2016, so about a year ago now, and that sets out our future direction in terms of health and wellbeing coverage in Breen. Um, again, I'll let you download that and read that in your leisure. There's not time to go in, in, into detail on that today, but that covers three key areas, occupant health and wellbeing and neighbour health and wellbeing, which have been integral parts of Breen since for many years now. But something we're going to start to look more of moving forward is actually health and safety in the construction process itself. Um, possibly less relevant to the UK market, but definitely as you go over overseas, uh, um, especially uh, yeah, moving into the de developing world, uh, yeah, there are some significant um, health and safety issues there that can be addressed. Um, the um, title of, of today's event mentioned about, about, about the new Bream. Um, that, I assume, was referring to our Bream UK New Construction 2018 scheme, which is going to be launched in early March of this year. Again, I won't dwell on, on this slide too much, but I think this basically summarises some of the, the, the changes that have been made to the existing health and wellbeing coverage uh, with, within Bream. Um, in most cases, that there haven't been any major, ma major changes. Uh, I think it's tweaks here and there, cl you know, clarifications, and, and, and so forth. Uh, probably the, 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 the main, main point to note is that we now have introduced another issue uh, within the health and wellbeing category called safe and healthy surroundings. Um, that covers safe access to buildings, uh, as well as outside space and, and amenity provision. Um, again, go, going, going back to, to the, the question that, that, that was posed by, by the event's title, um, which was Bream versus Well versus Fit Well. Well, uh, obviously, I don't think, given what, what we've all said today, none of, none of us would, would, would agree with that. Um, obviously, Bream is a sustainability standard with health and well-being, uh, health and well-being elements. So we, we'd encourage people to use Bream to cover. Uh, their sustainability aspiration, their wider sustainability aspirations, and then use well and or fit well and indeed, well, both if, 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 you, if, if you choose to, to yeah, demonstrate um, you're going the extra mile in, in terms of health and well-being of, 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 of the occupants of, of buildings. Um, final few slides. Um, obviously, health and well-being is a massive subject area. Um, BRE can't... Um, research and do everything it, it, it itself in, in terms of health and well-being. So, you know, there's lots of organi organisations active in, in that sphere. And, uh, yeah, we're, we're keen to collaborate with, with, with such organisations to bring the best um, of, of yeah, health and well-being standards and, and best practice with, with in, into Bream. Um, we've had, we've developed relationships in the past sort of year, 18 months, two years, with both IWBI and um, Centre for Active Design, who, 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 who run FitWell. Um, and part, part of that work is, is, is looking at harmonising our requirements and mutually recognising each other's standards where, where, where we're apl applicable where, and, and where they align. Um, done it earlier. Um, we've produced a couple of uh, you know, a, a couple of other other free free to download um, brief briefing papers in, in the last year um, one f um, mapping the bream requirements against the well building standards requirements and the other mapping the bream requirements against the fit well requirements um, just to point out the fit well requirements at the moment only cover uh, the bream in use scheme um, that was work led by our US um, partners and um, the well um, briefing paper covers the whole whole range of, of Bream schemes. So that's Bream for building schemes. The focus on on these is, is, is the building certification schemes. So that's the new construction schemes, the refurbishment fit out schemes, and the Bream international uh, sorry the Bream new scheme, and that covers both the UK and the international versions of, of those schemes. Um, the Well paper was um, launched about this time last year. We have. Uh, New, well, an update to, to, to that paper waiting in the wings, which hopefully in the next few days will, 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 will be launched. 
you know, just wait and sort out the press press release on that. So that's we, we've updated that in response to industry feedback from people who've been using the, the crosswalk documents to hopefully make it a bit clearer um, and yeah, make, make it make it easier to use for everyone. So I guess yeah, the purpose of these these documents is to improve the assessment processes for anyone seeking dual or even triple certification use, use, using the standards. Um, uh, I've mentioned that, yeah, we'll, we'll reissue the, the, these documents as and when um, Bream and Fitwell or Well um, are updated in the coming years. Obviously, we've got the 2018 version of new construction coming out soon, and um, hot on the heels of that, I think, um, version two of Well will be coming later this year. So, again, we, we'll, we'll update those uh, as and when those, those, those schemes come out. Um, uh, so, yeah, final slide. I think I'm just about on time. So... Just to summarise, BREAM is a sustainability assessment method for buildings, infrastructure and master planning projects. Uh, it covers a whole range of life cycle stages. Health and wellbeing is an integral part of BREAM. Um, BREAM health and wellbeing requirements align well with, with the other well-building standards. Um, and yeah, it can be used as a springboard for, for projects um, wishing to sort of demonstrate their wider um, start again so yeah do it yeah, uh, uh, yeah i've lost the train of thought now apologies um yeah meeting the bream requirements for, for health and well-being will be be a springboard for, for those projects that want to sort of go the extra mile in terms of health and well-being um credentials An ongoing collaboration with iwbi and cfad to 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 uh, help projects achieve um, multiple certification uh, that's it. Thank you. So, uh, Edward Dixon, who's a sustainability special projects at Landsec. So, we're now looking at a case study, effectively. Somebody's gone through the process. So, Ed joined Landsec in, Landsec in 2016, leading on sustainability design and corporate sustainability projects. So, in the first two years, he launched a new sustainability brief for developments, led research project on climate change, and delivered an ambitious sustainability plan for Westgate in Oxford. Um, <coughs> late, earlier on in his career, he, was, he worked on procurement, delivery, post-occupancy evaluation at uh, MNS, and, um, and uh, he has 16 years' experience in construction and sustainability management, holds an MBA uh, from Cass Business School. And he's going to talk about the work that Landsec did, the project that Victoria's already mentioned, uh, uh, looking at, it was Bream and Well, wasn't it, I believe? First standard to actually, first project to combine the two. So, over to you. Hi everyone, um, I agreed to this slot before Christmas and then my wife had a baby, so <laughs> I've had about four hours sleep and if I have sick on my blazer, then <laughs> if you just tell me now, maybe like take it off, it'll be a bit less awkward. Um, <coughs> so if I say anything weird, um, then or sort of fall asleep standing up, then just sort of come and prod me, or that, yeah, that would help. Um, so, uh, today I wanted to tell you our workplace story of moving to uh, a new office. Uh, we moved last year uh, in 2016 and what I wanted to tell was kind of the inside story of me going through this project, um, leading it from a sustainability and health and well-being perspective, but also of being an employee uh, going through the whole process of, uh, of, of moving offices. Um, I'm quite particular, I'm quite fussy about stuff, so moving to an office that works well, that removes the barriers to having a productive and a, 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 an enjoyable working day has been really like, it's been very important to me and it's, and it's um, made me like my job a lot more. So it's a, I think it's a good case study and I think it will give some good insights, I hope. So just uh, taking it back to um, 2016, um, Landsec, very different business then, we were previously Land Securities. Uh, we were at Five Strand. Did anyone go to our old offices at Five Strand? Yeah, yeah. So this was a really, really nice office in like 1998. Um, not so nice in uh, 2016. And uh, Westminster City Council have actually um, just given a go ahead to knock it down. So um, yeah, it, it wasn't fantastic. Um, it, was, it was great by old standards and it was an okay office, but it, but it wasn't really conducive to having a, a healthy working day. Um, the location, not fantastic. We were kind of hemmed in. It's at that really crappy bit of the Strand right at the end where it's just constant traffic and you're kind of hemmed in by tourists or some sort of protest on Trafalgar Square. It's, it's pretty awful. 
I mean, there are worse places to work, but this is not a, a particularly uh, a, a great individual location for an office. So uh, part of a kind of wider culture change effort for the business, uh, transforming the business from what it once was, which is a fairly traditional REIT, a tr fairly traditional property company, to being a, a, a much more uh, modern and, and, and open and collaborative business. So, uh, you know, standard at this point, steering groups were formed, uh, plans and budgets drawn up, um, research undertaken about how and when and where. And we actually did a really useful uh, pre-move leaseman survey, which flagged exactly how people felt about the office and how people felt about working at, uh, at then Land Securities. And one of the most important things uh, that was uh, really flagged at the early stage was, was getting the right location. As I said, being sort of right in the middle of uh, tourists and protests wasn't ideal, so we needed to find somewhere that, that, was, that was better, a better home for our business. Um, and we wanted to be in Victoria because um, most of these buildings down Victoria Street, so here from Nova at the end all the way to the other end, most of those buildings are Landsec and most of them have been developed over the last few years. So it really is kind of the middle of, it's the hub of the portfolio, if you will. Um, Victoria Transport Interchange has also had a lot of work to it, so uh, we wanted to be sort of right on top of the action. So Victoria was definitely the right place for us. Uh, and we sort of had a toss-up between a brand new building, which is Nova, which is now complete at the end here, or Cardinal Place, which is a couple of buildings along, which is a 10-year-old asset. And Cardinal Place gave us, gave us some really, really uh, useful benefits over Nova. So Nova is your traditional big floor plates, whereas Cardinal Place has this split uh, two separate buildings with a bridge that connects the two. And that really was one of the critical success factors uh, in getting our project to be a great place to work. Because having two separate floor plates means that you can have one area that is completely for staff and one area that's completely for investors. So I can come to work looking like a retired architect, that's my get up for today, um, and not worry about uh, sort of bumping into uh, an, an investor on the other side of the office, um, which is a very real proposition for some people, because if you're used to going and meeting BlackRock and you need to be wearing a tie and a suit, um, maybe you don't want to wear that every day, and maybe some days you don't have to meet with BlackRock, and maybe you just want to come in in your trainers, and, that, and that's fine. So this building was, was, was perfect, and that was one of the most important things that um, drove us to do it. So at this early stage of the project, we did what all good clients do, and we formed the perfect brief. We walked all of our design team and our uh, delivery partner team through the brief in exactly the right way, and we gave them all the materials we needed. Obviously, we didn't do that. It was a complete mess. Um, we sort of hurried along as things were moving very quickly, as often happens with these projects. Um, and really, we started uh, our process for um, uh, Brian Outstanding, uh, which we knew was a target and, and, and well pretty late on in the process. Uh, I mean, everyone's been there, right? It happens on, on, on a lot of projects. Things move quickly and you have to play catch up. Um, but really, what, you know, one, of, one of the biggest things that we noticed right at the start of this project is that we've really, really got to force a, a collaborative working environment in the project team. Um, and that goes from top to bottom, from the, the people that are working in, uh, in our teams through to the consultants that are actually managing the design, through to the delivery partners. Um, we used um, pre-contract agreements with our delivery partners. So I've got the contractor and the trade contractors below them on board with us early to start to critique and work through the design. And that gave real benefits in terms of getting the me mechanical electrical solution right, getting the lighting right. Um, so collaboration really at this point, when, when, when we're asking people to really to go the extra mile and deliver something amazing, making a really great collaborative environment in the project team was, was a real priority for us at those early stages. So, um, as the design starts to progress, uh, we also rebranded, and our new brand is really all about one thing, it's about experience. And that's about us using our experience as a business and the, the experience of the people and the partners that we work with to create great experiences. And these two projects, the brand projects of us rebranding and becoming a, a new business, and the office projects, were really, you know, they were part of the same journey. And how it's manifested, you know, you can see this is the business lounge in our, um, in our new space. So this is in the investor side, which is kind of the posh side. But... Um, this business lounge is, it gives a really, really great first impression. And I always ask people when they come and visit us, you know, how was your first impression? When you walked up the stairs into the office, how did people greet you at the front desk? How did they greet you when they walked into our office? 
Did the bottler come over and offer you a cup of coffee? Was it a nice coffee? You know, these things are all really, really important. The first 20 minutes that people spend with our business is absolutely paramount. So if people walk into a meeting, somebody's taken their suitcase and stowed it away neatly, and they've given them a nice cup of coffee, and they've had a nice relax on a nice uh, piece of furniture. That's just a nice intro to our business. So that was really, really important. So experience was one thing that came out as being um, not a target, but a, a very important theme throughout the whole project. So just getting into a little bit of the detail on how we achieved the standard uh, and, and some of uh, the, the, the benefits that we sort of got from the back of it. So we used Briam really uh, to deliver the basics. So um, as we've heard in these presentations already today, um, the two standards do work really well together. Um, and Briam, the health and well-being credits, if you target them all, it gives you a really useful and easy framework that most of the consultants are used to working with to deliver on things like lighting and acoustics. And, and, and it works, and the two, the two standards work really well together. So this is the main space. This is our side of the office, which is the, the, the employee side. Uh, and you can see uh, exposed ceiling, um, so quite a complex m and &E solution. Um, LED circadian lighting throughout the office. Um, lots and lots of different uh, styles of surfaces and, uh, and, and finishes. So really, you, you really need that Briam framework to critique all of the finishes, all the lighting, all of the acoustics. Uh, and it does provide a useful framework to do that. So that was early on, that was, that was probably the most useful thing. We've also got um, a, quite a, a sort of detailed acoustics design. So obviously with an open ceiling, the engineers in the room will know that that creates problems. Um, but we, uh, we've included white noise machines uh, all the way through the office to create privacy and also to mask the noise of the open services, which could be a problem in uh, later meeting the, uh, the well standard. So, yeah, it's all about really getting the basics right, the things that people can't see uh, at these early stages using that Briam framework as the, as the way to do that. So, as well as the things that people can't see, uh, I think the things that people can see are also uh, really important too, and it's the things that people use every day, the technology, the furniture, um, that provide a really, really important part of the solution. Now, we kind of screwed ourselves with this because we signed up to do the uh, responsible sourcing credits in Briam, which are a bit of an admin task. Sorry, but it really is. Um, we signed up to do FSC project certification and decide that, decided to do that for the furniture as well. Um, and then we also obviously had uh, the well certification to deliver as well. So the, the combination of those three things together, I mean, let's say to start with, you've got that many furniture suppliers to, to, to choose from. You now have that many. And it doesn't push the price up. Our furniture solution uh, and the various different you know, items that we have all the way through the office weren't any more expensive than non-sustainable options or at least options that couldn't provide the right evidence. You just had less choice. Um, because there are so few companies out there that provide furniture at this scale that can actually provide the documentation that you need to guarantee that the glues don't have the, you know, these particular chemicals in them. So the furniture solution was a really, really important part of it and very, very difficult to get right. But we feel like we have got it right. Um, throughout the office, we've got about 350 fixed desks. The majority of those are sit-stand with the little buttons on the side. We've got treadmill desks. We've also got um, about 700 places to sit in total. So 300 fixed desks, 700 places to sit, and we have about 350 staff using the office day to day. So there's a huge variance across the office of different heights of furniture. You've got sort of high benches, low benches. We have library and atrium spaces uh, with soft seating. There are hubs and there are booths. There are a lot of different places to work. And that needed to work hand-in-hand hand with technology as well. So we, we all have Surface Pros now instead of like four-inch thick la laptops, which is quite nice. Um, but it means that it encourage pe encourages people to have an active working day. You know, my kind of default position at work is standing, and throughout the day I'll go and, you know, sit on a different surface or review a presentation with someone that's sitting at a high bench with a screen on it, or we'll stand in front of a big Microsoft Surface Hub screen and we'll critique something or work on a whiteboard. So it does work. You know, I use a lot of different surfaces every day. Don't get me wrong, there are still people in the office who absolutely don't use them, and they come in and they sit in the same spot every day and they sit down every day, and that's okay. But for the people who do want to have an active working day, it's there. So the, getting the technology right, getting the furniture right, getting the, the basics to underpin uh, right um, uh, is, is, is kind of where we've got to so far. 
And then that needs to be matched with the right workplace services. So this is our support bar. It's a little bit like the genius bar. I don't think we're allowed to say that in Apple. Um, so essentially, you can go up, and Luke on the right is from um, IT support, and you can go to Luke, and you can ask him for anything you want, whether it's like a new keyboard or you've got this virus problem or whatever. So it's a human face to services. They're there. A lot of people have this now. I know it's very common, but it, it really works for us. There's a human person standing there giving you some help. Uh, and they've all had training to kind of, you know, kind of customer service and that, that sort of thing. And then on the other side, we've got the post room. So if you need uh, something like a sewing kit or you need um, maybe like a new lanyard or you need a new security pass or something, there's someone from post room there who can help you out. And that's the same for like those last minute when you realize you haven't got your room set up in the right way because you didn't book it. You need someone to move a load of tables. You know, they're there and they're always there and you can always find someone. And that's really, really important. And I think that's, for me, is certainly one of the things that helps me feel like I'm able to work productively. Um, and when we measured this in the Leasman survey, our pre-move Leasman on productivity, 67% um, of people felt like they were able to work productively in the office. That went up to 88% in our new office. That's a 20% increase, which is the highest increase in the history of the Leasman survey. Um, and we're now t joint top of the Leasman overall for workplace satisfaction. So we can't say that people are more productive in, in our new office, but we can say that people feel more productive. And if people feel more productive, I think that's kind of half the battle, and we're almost there towards people actually being more productive. Um, and our Leasman results um, definitely prove that, I think. We really do have a sewing kit. That is me with the sewing kit. Um, so uh, probably one of the final areas to, to look at is kind of uh, health and well-being, which I haven't really mentioned explicitly yet. So over and above getting the basics right, uh, lighting, acoustics, creating the right environment, getting the things that people can't see absolutely um, uh, correct. We also wanted to you know, finish the space with all the things that people can see. So yoga classes twice a week. Um, we actually have like an easy yoga class and then a hard yoga class. Um, so you can choose whichever you want to, want, you, you want to go to and that works well. Um, workplace uh, healthcare services. So we have uh, the Doctor Care Anywhere app. I don't know if any other companies have that. It's from Nuffield Health. It means that instead of you know, it's 2 o'clock on a Thursday afternoon. You just realize you need to go and see a GP for something. You don't need to book it the following day and then go the following afternoon. You can get a video appointment on your phone within about two hours usually. It is amazing. It's absolutely amazing. Which just, it, you know, it avoids that two, three hours out of work, and it helps you to get your issue, whatever it is, dealt with more quickly. Brilliant. Um, about 350 employees, so over half the business have registered for that service, um, and we've also had about a third of our business going through really thorough annual healthcare checkups, which check absolutely everything. They take hours and they're, they're, they're brilliant. Um, so th those are just a couple of things that they've, that they've included, but the healthcare offer to our employees is a real core part of this space. Uh, it's about removing the barriers to having uh, better healthcare and having a, a more healthy lifestyle. We also have a great food offer. So uh, in our old office, we had a canteen, which had a sort of free lunch every day. Now we have snacks, healthy snacks throughout the day that have all the nice little bits of food labeling on them. Um, so we have, in the mornings, we have like free fruit and free breakfast. In the afternoons, don't tell anyone we have cheese and biscuits. Not strictly healthy, but um, people have to have fun stuff too. Um, and the, the food offer combined with kind of the health offer, I think just really makes it clear to people that being healthy is a really important thing for employees in our business. Uh, and it looks like spontaneous planking is a thing. Uh, so, so fit well causes spontaneous planking. Well and Briam together also cause spontaneous planking. Now, if anybody knows Landsec, this is quite a traditional re, you know, it's a property company. Uh, and the thought of us planking, and this is the whole office, on a Friday afternoon in our old office, that would never have happened. Absolutely never. Uh, we have this weird fire alarm that goes off at 5 o'clock on a Friday, and it takes about a minute and a half, and it's just such a drag. So we now plank through it. Um, <laughs> people are really genuinely interested in health. Um, so what sets us apart? I think probably the biggest thing that sets us apart from other projects is that it's an existing building. So it's a 10-year-old building, and we've delivered our space, Brigham Outstanding and Well Silver. 
So if anybody is hearing these kind of comments about, oh, you know, older buildings, it's a real nightmare to do health and well-being stuff, it isn't. The only change that we made to the shell and core is we changed the filters in the air handling units. They were already the right specification, we just put new ones in so that they were nice and new and clean. It's the only thing we did, and we passed all of the um, air tests um, and all of the other measures in Briam and Well. Um, we're the second and we're the largest well-certified space in the UK. I think we're the only project to achieve uh, BRIAM Outstanding and well. Uh, and we're the highest rated BRIAM Outstanding fit out. Um, at least we were a couple of months ago. Someone's probably beaten us now. Um, I haven't put a lot of words in my slides. So if they do get mailed out to you after, they won't be very useful. But please look. There is a BBP case study about this project, which kind of has all of the stuff that I've been talking about, all of the stats and the numbers and everything else. And that's very useful, so please use that. We also have a BCO paper on corporate culture and the effect that new workplaces have on creating a positive workplace culture. And that's on the BCO website, and it's free to access now. Thank you very much. So can I ask our speakers to come and have a, uh, a seat? So thank you for the presentation and introduction of the different scheme, and it's great to see the collaboration. But as designer, we are being asked by our client which schemes you know they should go for. It's not very often that you can do both at the same time because you know obviously budget and then not only hard course but also soft course having you know all the administration extra work on 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 achieving these standards. So would you be able to give us a pros and cons of different standard. I know that it's going to be a debate, Ooh. but this is the question that we are being asked by a lot of our clients. You guys are all biased, so I'm going to take that one. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I think if your clients are asking you that question, they're asking you the wrong question. And that's genuinely, that's what I would say to them. Um, I think you, in your role as advising them and being their architect, can encourage them to ask what they actually want to achieve. And then you can advise them as to whether those frameworks enable them to achieve those outcomes. So asking, do we want to do BRIAM, is not the right question. That's not a valid question. It doesn't mean anything. It, you, you have to ask them, what, what do you want to get? What do you want to get out of the process? Um, well, I, I'm sure most of them would say, you know, it's both planet and people. So they will want to have everything. So mm -hmm. in a way that it's quite difficult for designer to... Sure, but is it the certification that they want? Do they just want the badge? Because if that's what they want, and, and you ask them that question back to them and say, do you just want the certification? They say, yeah, well, really, that's all we want. Fine, that's okay. But it's about getting the right framework to deliver what they really want. And whilst I think... Um, Briam can certify the basics. Uh, what it can't do is test it and make sure that it really has been, uh, really has been delivered. And, and, and a useful way to, to illustrate the difference between those um, is, is furniture. So a lot of the time, if you deliver a space and you do Briam and you test the air quality at the end of the project, you might test it before the furniture goes in because that's the construction project and you're certifying the construction project. The person that's doing the furniture package, they're probably not going to do all the work on air quality. So you put the furniture in, and you'll fail. Do you see what I mean? So it's, it's, it's about picking the right framework to do the right thing. If the client wants a nice big green badge, fine. If they want the, the air quality to be tested and to be absolutely correct, they probably have to use the new version of Bream that's coming out this year, or they need to use well. And there's a real difference there between actually really getting it right and testing it and having it absolutely um, as, as you designed it or doing the kind of early stage design style certification. They're very, very different in that way. And would you describe Fit Weld as light well in a way because of the budget and, and also the scopes that it covers seems to be okay, so allowing flexibility, yeah. but it doesn't cover you know, everything that seems to well have mentioned. So there's, um, there's bits that Fit Weld does that well doesn't do. So there's, there's overlaps and gaps between the two. So. Um, what I think Fitwell does incredibly well is it deals with the situation that 90% of people have in their own office, which is that they're not going to go into a new building. It's unlikely they're going to get a major fit-out happening yet. So, you know, every five or ten years, businesses move. But we have a public health crisis um, around stress and well-being in, in our workplaces. So what kind of measures can you implement, like we did within six weeks, that are impactful and start to, to move you on to that journey of changing your culture? 
So it is always, it's a phrase, horses for courses. So it really is completely dependent on your circumstance. So to your point about doing that, actually the visioning bit, you need to do a health and wellbeing workshop. And it's going to be specific to every client's needs. Some will be constrained by time, some by budget, some by scared of you know, paperwork. Others will you know, think one might be easier to achieve than the other, but they want to start a journey. But you're only going to have that conversation by having a, a, an open review. A lot of our clients look at both. They're massively into the idea of doing either one of them. And we end up leaving them with a framework where they have gone, do you know what, this is what's most important to my organization now. This is what my staff tell me. Um, and the main thing is actually almost not to talk to the, to the client, but to talk to the user. Um, because that's part of the problem is that the person that's probably missing from your conversation is the head of HR or the union rep. Um, and the person that you're probably interfacing with is a project manager or a money person. When we've had projects where we've um, talked about health and well-being opportunities in terms of productivity or lost days or whatever, and then the CFO goes, all right, I'm onto this now. There's a, there's a language that we need to change about the opportunity. So we do tend to hear people focusing on the upfront costs, but the payoffs are so large that they're only going to be recognized when you have the person that pays, which is the HR person in the room, rather than the person that's focused on CapEx. I think that's a brilliant answer from all of you. I mean, is there anything else that you'd want to add within that? I mean, it's, it's the thing that's going to suit the specific project, isn't yeah. it, yeah. to do with Endgame, yeah. which is fantastic that there's actually a range of opportunities of things that's out there, that we have some options. Uh, and actually, and they're yeah. not necessarily independent. One might be the beginning of the journey to then move towards something else if and when maybe you do move and you have maybe the budget. I think that's... I, just, I think seeing the competition is, is exciting. Um, and in a way, it's less evident, say, for a sustainability standard, because BRIAM is the preeminent, uh, very rare that people do lead in the UK. But people have a choice now, and it is going to make both standards better. I think that's, that's and I think, you know, the V2 will, will address things in well currently that are harder to do, and FitWell is changing in response, and that's great. It means we're going to get a better product for everyone. I just had one thing to add on cost. So this is on the BBP case study, but... Um, 2% of our project cost uplift, as in things that we did because we needed to meet the certification that we might not have done anyway. Uh, so, so 2%, 1.5% of that was for Briam, and that was in handling demolition waste, which was much more expensive and time consuming to do it in a, in a, in a sustainable way instead of just sort of shoving it all out the door. Uh, and it was in a low temperature hot water system that we might not have installed it was kind of questionable whether we definitely would have installed it anyway. So 1.5% for those two things and fees, and then 0.5% to meet well, which was fees and certification. So we didn't spend any money on well that we wouldn't have spent anyway on, you know, little bells and whistles and gadgets and stuff that we might need. We would, we would have spent it anyway. So there was, uh, in essence, except fees, no project cost uplift. But that's because we had a good project to start with, with a bought-in HR team. You know, we had a reasonably good strategy at, from, from, from the start. That's interesting. And presumably, also, what it's doing is it's the focusing the mind and giving you a framework within what, where you spent that money, you know, to actually, and a means with which you can convince or prove that it's the right thing to do to the people who are making the decisions or have got the money to pay for it within the, the organization. Excellent. Another question? One at the front here. Just if you wait for the microphone, that'd be great. Thank you. Uh, to what extent are these standards being applied in residential projects? Question. It's going um, to be my question. Yes. <laughs> so commercial office is definitely our biggest market segment at the moment. That was the first version one was in 2014, um, and it's the majority of registered projects. There are just under 100 projects registered for multifamily residential pilot. So that's been our biggest kind of secondary category. And here in the UK, there's a lot of discussions around kind of student accommodation, senior living facilities, and the PRS market, and how that's changing the face of residential development moving forward. Um, so it's definitely the kind of the second hot topic and, and industry we're seeing grow. It's an interesting question, especially with the, uh, the uh, green paper that's come out, isn't it, regarding health and homes. Presumably, you're all aware of that, which is looking at this, maybe led by the UK GBC, done some interesting research on that. Yeah. Yeah. It's, um, it's a question for, for Ingrid, I don't know how involved you've been in HQM as to whether there's a, 
you know, that's something that's likely to grow within the home quality yeah, mark. so I think um, people probably aren't aware, home quality mark, we launched as a beta pilot version I think it was a couple of years ago now. We've just, yeah, we've, we've piloted that over the last couple of years. I think there's, I don't know the exact figures, but we're talking about 100,000 plus properties registered under that scheme. Um, at the moment, um, we're publicly consulting on the final version of, of HQM um, called HQM1. I think consultation runs to another sort of month or so. Um, but yeah, I think yeah, home quality mark. It was it was developed to sort of um, plug the hole that's been left by the withdrawal of the code for sustainable homes. So it's it's Bream. Its origins are in Bream, but I think it's presented quite differently. But there are lots of plenty of health and well-being elements within the um, with, 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 within the home quality mark. Um, given it's applying to a you know, domestic pre uh, premises, some of the requirements aren't quite stretching as you would possibly could do for, for a non-domestic building. It doesn't cover potentially all of the, the, the issues that, that we cover in the, in the, in the non-domestic schemes. But yeah, there's lots of health and health and well-being elements to, to HQM. And they, 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 they've also developed a, a, a well-being indicator as well as the scoring, you know, traditional scoring system. Um, um, that, that, that there's, yeah, that, that there's a well-being um, indicator as well so you can assess your performance against that. Interesting. Any other questions at the bucket? Yeah, over here. Hi, um, mine's more of a technical question. I actually work at an architect's, but weirdly I'm looking at measuring the air quality within our working environment. I've done loads of research on the different kind of air quality readers that you can get, and a lot of them out there seem to be not great, I guess. So I'm, I'm interested in, in which ones that you would advise. And I saw when you had the image up that you had the FUBOT, I think. Yeah. But the feedback is quite often that the, the readings are a bit misleading. So whether or not there's stuff that's coming out or whether we should wait or whether we should be a little bit cautious with the, the systems that we have. Okay, so the, it's really important to, to ask the question, what are you going to use the data for? Yeah. So food bots are plus minus 20% all over the place on things, but even if they're not, they're calibrated when they come out of the factory, and they'll, but they'll go off like all sensors will do. If you're interested in change and understanding trends, really super useful. Um, and really super cheap. Um, so for us, it's been very, very helpful. We just analyzed our first year of comparative data between two offices with our Fubot. And actually, the most insightful thing about the data is they have a crude overall measure of uh, how are you doing? Is it great down to poor? And we can track the number of hours in a year where we went into different categories of overall quality. And we're doing, doing pretty well. Um, what we know from, um, we haven't tested lots of the different sensors, but most of the people I'm talking to now, on the domestic scale, they're talking about AWARE as being the, the best of the domestic scale ones. If you go and step up into the next level, then you start looking at interfacing with the reset standard and lots of new air quality monitors that are coming out. The secret to all of this is they're almost all using exactly the same chips that are coming from the same factories in China. So there's probably not a huge amount of difference between all of them, unless you go up to that lab grade stuff where you're talking about spending serious, serious money. So you always have to look at what's the cost of collecting that data versus the value you're going to get from it and what actions you're then going to take from it would be my advice. Yeah, and if, if you speak to my indoor air quality experts at BRE, they'll say, yeah, the food book type on it is great, as I said, for monitoring what, what's going on. Yeah. Um, but to get a definitive answer, you really need to be taking, yeah, yeah sampling tubes, you know, pumping um, air through, through, through sampling tubes and then get them analysed at a laboratory to get the definitive number if something is above, <laughs> above a threshold. But that yeah. is obviously an expensive uh, yeah. option to do. So I think trust in the Well, I mean, it, um, I think the answer is it's, it's good enough. What was fascinating for us was one of my colleagues would kept coming to work with terrible skin complaints and coughs. And so we lent him the food bot to take home to his house that he was refurbishing. And the results from, we got a kind of a three week period of data and it is terrifying. And you can see the trend from when they start cooking, what happens to the particulates and the CO2 levels in, in the space. And at the end of it, he then um, paid a couple hundred quid to have a deep clean done by cleaners of his house after they've done their <laughs> works. And the levels come right back down. So in a way, that's the market Foodbot is massively powerful in, is giving data to people in, in that kind of setting. But it, for us, it's been good enough. That's great. I've got a Foodbot at home as well, and that led to me getting a cleaner. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>
I guess just to add on that one, the, the kind of worlds in monitors is these kind of three different grades. You've got yeah. consumer stuff like Fubot and the things you'd buy on Amazon for hundred pounds. Mm. You've got the lab grade, which is inaccessible to most people, certainly as individuals, and then projects, that's a huge investment. And then there's this gap in the middle with kind of commercial grades. This is what we're all hoping for and wanting to see more of. And that's the space that Reset is, is aiming for. Yeah. So I guess where I disagree with Ed on Reset, which is something that we're really interested in and kind of working with to develop further, is they always make sure the, the monitors are calibratable so that over time you are actually able to reset them against the lab grade device and you do have a greater degree of confidence in the absolute reading which is helpful. Fubot, I think, is great if you're an individual <laughs> and you want to learn more about how your behaviors impact things. Yeah. But if you were a building operator looking after a large population of people and you were starting to think how you might adjust your systems, yeah. I would yeah. not use a tool like Fubot to That's do that. That's where I'm at, yeah. So we yeah. have an open plan office of 100 people. Right. And we analyze the air quality. <laughs> yeah, and a lot of people are interested in doing this because they want to be kind of foot ahead for when the individuals start coming forward with <coughs> skin complaints, headaches, and so on. But I would say the quality of the data and the response you'll be able to give if you've only got a foobot to fall back on and you yeah. say, well, this has been in the space for a year and now it's completely off. I spoke to your consultant, Alice, and they actually said for the time being to, if I wanted reliable data to be concerned about the CO2 readings, they're the ones that are going to have the impact on the people in the office with fatigue and yeah. Yeah. We, we use the reset uh, system, um, we use the uh, monitors that they recommended, and uh, we took about three months of solid data, and um, we realized that the CO2 levels were peaking about, about 1.30, 2 o'clock, and everyone in the office was falling asleep. Yeah. <laughs> uh, over 2,000. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> But they were, they were very good and they worked fine, so. Okay, that's yeah. Brilliant. Thank great, thank you very much. Uh, I think we've got time for one more question. So we've got one at the back there, yeah. Um, you mentioned finding furniture suppliers and so on and how the, it can limit when you start looking at Brie and Well. Um, what I was wondering is you see a lot of furniture suppliers now kind of looking more into well-being, <laughs> but more so with regards to kind of layout rather than necessarily the materials, the furniture's produced in and so on. Were there any companies that you felt uh, were outstanding in regards to being able to provide that kind of information, the VOC air quality and so on? S sorry, the, the information on air quality from specific furniture providers? Or? Yeah, was there, anybody, was there anybody who excelled in regards to kind of like bo both being able to provide that certification and yeah. being able to provide furniture that, that met the WELL standard or met the BRIAM standard? Yeah, um, if you grab me after, I'll send you the spreadsheet of everything that we bought Oh, uh, right. Because okay. we have, I mean, there are probably, like, I don't know if you, you know furniture. I now know stuff about furniture. <laughs> but, um, yeah. but essentially, we use, like, a, a main contractor who then contracted out to probably 20 kind of sub suppliers mm. who then actually get them made because a lot of it's bespoke from yeah. a huge network of, of sub suppliers beneath that. And um, off the, 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 the one thing that I really noticed with the furniture suppliers is we asked them right up front. Um, or the, the furniture contractor asked them right up front, okay, here is the list of stuff that we need. And what they tended to do is a bit like principal contractors sort of 10 years ago. They would look at it and go, ooh, sustainability stuff. Yeah, we've got all that. And then we'd, they'd send you back a zip file with like ISO 14001, <laughs> you know, a load of useless stuff that you didn't really need or like their office recycling certificate to say they'd recycled 99% of their waste that week or something. It's just like, come on. Yeah. Um, but we did eventually get it from them and the companies that we worked with, Orange Box were amazing. Mm -hmm. um, the companies that we worked with provided on the whole pretty much everything we need and nine times out of 10, they, 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 they got it right. Um, there was one horrific example. Um, we had a red, uh, two red phone boxes, which are these sort of fun replica phone boxes. Uh, they were delivered into the office uh, and then we noticed that they smelled really bad uh, and it turned out they were painted with lead paint 
<laughs> and uh, we called the guy up and said, you know, what's the deal? We've got lead paint on these phone boxes and um, you've sold them to us. And he said, well, it wasn't a problem for a lot of other businesses that have got them installed all around the capital. And a lot of these other businesses have apparently got wellbeing standards. So I think there's a bit of a disconnect there. Lots of double checking. <laughs> maybe when people are doing the air testing before the furniture goes in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, so, you know, red phone boxes, just check the paint. But otherwise, <laughs> um, okay. yeah. So Fantastic, gonna, thanks. Thank, thank you very much for your question. We have to squeeze one more quick question in from the front here. And then, um, we're going to, then I'm going to ask you for your single key thing of advice that you would like to impart or top tip. Maybe, maybe it's furniture, I don't know, but I'm going to spend... Okay, thank you very much. Excellent presentations, I really enjoy them. But one thing I haven't heard anything about is electromagnetic fields. And uh, this is a, the impact in he on health and even people wearing those things yeah. is massive. Uh, I think I got a bit used now after 27 years in London. When I first came, I have to go to the parks, take my shoes off and discharge because of the impact. And... Okay, so electromagnetic fields, if we can, thank you. Very quickly, Shall if you I can. Start? Yeah. Uh, it was something that the team looked at as they were compiling the pilot. And when they were doing the review of all the research out there, they just found that there was too much disagreement in the research community about exactly whether it was unsafe, what the safe thresholds were. So there's, like, there's not enough evidence base at the moment for us to feel confident to define it as a feature and a strategy moving forward. I know that's different kind of culturally in different parts of the world. It's like Germany is very hot on this topic. And if you look at their kind of building biology, it's a very strong theme that comes through. So it could be something that a well project could look at for an innovation feature if they pulled together the research and the rationale and how they've kind of defined their performance criteria around it. And otherwise, we will keep looking at how the research evolves and when we feel we've reached that kind of peak of having enough to justify it. Excellent. Thank you. So I think I'm going to ask, starting with Ed from this side, Ed, to talk about a key issue that you think that you would like to impart the guidance of somebody embarking on a project to improve the well-being within uh, an existing environment. <coughs> Let's look at that. Way. Okay. Um, I wouldn't start with the standards. I'd start with your staff. Um, have a workshop. Talk to people about what matters to them, the problems that they have. There are surveys out there that you can do to get a, a better judge what it is. But start with um, what people want and need and the, the issues that are critical and relevant to your workplace and then, and then look at how you can use these frameworks to take your next steps. Okay. Sure. Uh, my takeaway will probably be performance matters. So building on what Ed was saying, there can be some great intentions. You can think you're doing the right thing, but unless you measure and actually check what's happening when people are in there, you just don't know. It's a complicated field. <laughs> This is much getting tougher, I know, as you're going down the line. <laughs> Sorry about that. Chris? Um, I think my, my, my take-home message would be start the process as early as possible in the, in, 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 in the design process and mm. yeah, consider sustainability and health and well-being at the same time. Good advice. I think I would just say change the conversation. You know, if you get stuck in the weeds talking about, uh, you know, a tiny bit of fee about this specific thing, you're, just, okay. you're talking about the wrong thing. Mm. Change the conversation with the client. Well, I don't know about you, but I think it's been an enlightening, fascinating uh, talk and brilliant to get these individual insights. So if we could just thank all of our speakers. <laughs>